Hello, everybody. So my name is Adriana, and I'm one of the organizers of the Teens Neuroscience Seminar Series, which is this. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you here, and thank you for your interest in our seminar. Uh, we have around 70 people registered for this talk, so hopefully everybody will join in. Uh, the Teens Neuroscience Seminar Series was born at the initiative of Teens, which is the Transylvanian Institute of Neuroscience. It is a research institute in Cluj-Napoca, Romania, and we here at, fin at Teens feel that neuroscience is still poorly represented in many countries and therefore deserves more coverage here in Romania and why not worldwide. Uh, we aim to bring neuroscience closer to those who share our passion for it, whether they work in this field or not, and inspire them to be more curious about the brain. We hold uh, free online seminars periodically, once or twice a month, with a wide, var wide variety of speakers from all corners of neuroscience. And the format today will be a five-minute intro, a 40-minute talk, followed by a 15-minute Q&A section. Uh, please post any questions you might have in the Q&A section panel of Zoom, which should appear at the bottom of your screen, and feel free to upvote or comment existing questions. In the Q&A section, we will read out uh, your interesting questions to, for Jörg to answer. Uh, we also have a moderator today, which is Alina Garner. She is an assistant professor at Harvard University and has, has worked with Jörg a long time. And I will give the word to her. Hi, thank you, Adriana. Um, so I'm very excited today to introduce Dr. Georg Keller. He, he prefers to go by Georg. Um, so Georg blazed an incredible trail in a fundamental computation performed by the brain called predictive coding. Um, and it's very likely that this computation is performed not just by one kind of brain, but probably by all kinds of brains. So I wanna give you a, a brief background on, on what he's done to blaze this trail. So. During his PhD work, uh, Georg studied songbirds, and he discovered that when birds sing, a part of their brain that processes sounds does not respond to the bird's song when the sound of the song matches what the bird expects it to be. But the bird that's because the bird has an expectation, of course, of what the sound should be because it's generating the sound. However, when Georg manipulated the sound of the song so that it did not match what the bird thought it would be producing, then the bird's brain generated error signals every time there was a deviation from this expectation. And then why would this happen in a bird's brain? Well, probably so that the birds can distinguish between their own self-generated sounds and sounds generated by the environment. So that's where he started. And then he went on to do his postdoc where he changed and studied visual processing in mice that were locomoting, just walking or running. So like us humans and all species that move and have vision, when we move through space, the world around us moves in a predictable way. So when we speed up, the world around us will also speed up. And when we slow down, the world also slows down. So that's visual flow, speeding up and slowing down. So Jorg built a virtual reality and then measured neural activity in the visual cortex of mice. And the reason he used virtual reality is so that he could have empirical control of the world. So now mice are running along and they see the world moving uh, normally with respect to them. So they have normal visual flow. And then Jorg would suddenly halt the world. So even though mice were still moving, the world would stop and that's not what they expected. And sure enough, he found these neurons in visual cortex that generated error signals in response to this mismatch between what the mouse expected to see and what it actually saw. So why would our brains do this? Well, probably so that we can distinguish between self-generated and externally generated movements. Um, so for a, just a little slightly more uh, personal background in my experience in working with Georg, I did my postdoctoral work with Georg in Switzerland. Now I'm an assistant professor. Um, when I was a, a postdoc with Georg, I thought, he was a great mentor because he has this ability to take something that's extremely challenging and make it seem very straightforward and relatively simple. And this is extremely valuable because he changes your perception of something, which makes you then proceed. And by the time you realize that it's actually very challenging, you're in the middle of it. And so you may as well keep going. And so then you finish up <laughs> and um, you end up doing something that you didn't even realize you could do. And it's all because he changed your internal model of how you thought the world worked. So with that, I would like to give the floor to Georg. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alina, for this wonderful introduction. Um, I, I'm very happy to hear. Um, yes, as, as um, Alina just uh, alluded to, a lot of our work um, over the 
uh, past uh, 10 years. Sorry, I'm trying to share a screen here. One second. Um, I hope you can see this. Oh, that's good. Excellent, thank you. Um, yes, a lot of our work over the over the past many years, I stopped counting, and uh, um, has been has been dedicated to this idea of, of predictive processing. And I, along with many other uh, incredible people along the way that have, have you know been along for the ride, like Alina, um, have and and many of which are also the current ones in the lab are, are listed here at the bottom. So these are the people who are doing all the work um, uh, in our lab at the moment. Um, have been pursuing this idea of predictive processing. And then we stumbled upon something maybe maybe a year or two ago that has completely changed, once again, our trajectory, at least certainly mine. I, I assume many people in the lab as well. But it's something that I was so fascinated by that that, um, that really has, I feel fundamentally reorient, reoriented our lab and, and, and the things we're, we're pursuing. And, then, and this is in relation to this. Um, so hence the title of circuit approach to psychosis. So the, the thing we were pursuing, let me first tell you, <clears throat> so this is all in, in the making. We have, for most things I will show you today, we have no clue what it means or what, what it, why we're seeing these things, um, but they look really interesting. And this is the, the sort of point I wanted to make. So I, unfortunately, I won't have a lot of answers for you today, but I'll try to explain why I am so excited by these uh, findings that uh, we've we've been seeing over these last one or two years. Um, so initially, this all started with with this question: How does the how does the brain know something is um, externally generated, and how does it know it's an activity pattern? How it's internally generated, which is which is a question that that is very deep at the heart of of predictive processing, is which in, and I would argue still rather unsolved. But right? this which which neural circuit is responsible for conscious perception, right? This is, people call this the neural correlate of conscious perception, but what, what needs to be active in the brain for us to perceive something, right? That then we think is in the external world. And obviously if this goes awry, then, then uh, you might be seeing or hearing things that aren't really there. And instead of using um, mouse models of disease, mouse models of schizophrenia, which is I think a perfectly um, a, a valid approach, we chose to do something else and that is to see what the effects of the drugs are. Sorry, obviously we're not the only people who, are, who have been doing this and are doing this, but but we chose at the time, instead of to use mouse models of disease, just to ask the question, what happens to the cortical circuit when we give a mouse, in our case, most of our research is on mice, when we give a mouse a drug that is in humans is known to alter their perception. Right? Uh, there's multiple categories of these drugs. One of them are antipsychotics, which we use in, in schizophrenia patients to reduce acute psychosis, for example, um, or uh, psychedelic drugs that in you know most people induce um, uh, hallucinations of different varieties. And then also anesthetics, which just turn off um, uh, conscious perception. And it's a very, in essence, in hindsight, it's a very banal question, which is, do these drugs, have common signature, right? Most of our work is now on antipsychotics because uh, that's the drug we used first, or that, sorry, the class of drugs that we used first. And what is important to know is that we don't, I, I would argue, and this, I assume some people would disagree. I would argue we don't really know how these antipsychotics work. Um, for most of them, there's about 80 compounds that are approved that are used in the clinic. Um, for most of them, we know what the receptor binding profiles are, or at least partially. They all bind to a plethora of different receptors. Um, many of the compounds that are effective bind to completely different targets. So, the, you know, for, for about 100 years, the idea was D2 antagonism is what you need to do to be an antipsychotic. Now, just a week or two ago, there was a uh, a, a drug, a new antipsychotic that came came to market that uh, act doesn't bind to D2 at all. It's an M4 agonist, right? But has antipsychotic efficacy. Now, nowadays we know that the class of drugs that are efficacious as, as antipsychotics are much much larger than the initial idea that you know you had to be a D2 antagonist to be an antipsychotic. Anyway, so that's that's sort of the background. We we don't really know what they bind to. Uh, sorry, we know, we know for every class of, for every molecule what it binds to, but we don't know what the effect needs to be in the circuit. So this is this is to this day I would argue poorly understood as to what happens when 
to the circuit uh, when when um, you you introduce one of these drugs that in humans right, is known to cause these antipsychotic effects. Right, so that was sort of the premise. That's where we started, and that's just to motivate why we would even do these somewhat crazy experiments. And and the idea was, can we then identify a signature right of a specific cell type that has a certain effect of an antipsychotic? Right? Do are these all you know? Can we identify which cell type has the effect? That would be at the time we thought really cool, and I think we can. Right, that's why I'm so excited about it. Anyway, so what we do, what um, postdoc in the lab. Um, did then, uh, Matthias Seindorf, is um, use a technique that's called, uh, that you're probably familiar with, it's called wide field calcium imaging. What you're seeing here is just raw data, um, or I think median normalized raw data. Um, but but this is what it looks like. If you if you look, sorry, if you, for those of you not familiar, but on the left, you should see a, a mouse brain. This is an entire mouse brain, the olfactory bulb at the front, the cerebellum at the back. and and most of what you can see in this air in this red marked area is dorsal cortex. So visual cortex here would be in the back, um, orbital frontal in the front. Auditory cortex here is probably just barely visible here laterally in this prep. Um, somatosensory cortex dominates uh, what we're looking at. Right? But this is just sort of this dorsal uh, view of activity. And now, now the key is that we can do this. Um, in a cell type specific manner. And I will just, we, we've done this for 10 different cell types where you can use a Cree line, a mouse Cree line for a layer four or a layer two, three excitatory cell for SST cells, PV cells, you name it, right? The Cree lines that exist that label subsets of, of cortical cells. We, we took those, we expressed calcium indicators in those cells, and now we can measure cortex wide activity uh, of these cells. Uh, in a cell type specific manner. And I will, I will only show you the two extremes, right? So just be aware we we have done sort of a, a whole range of things, um, but at the very, at the two very extremes are these two phenotypes. So the first thing I'll show you is what we call a brain-wide recording. And th this is a bit of a misnomer. We use a PHP virus that, that uses a specific promoter, typically F1 alpha. Um, so the, the virus has a tropism, the promoter has a cell type specific preference. So we're not really getting all cells, but it's it's as, as close to all cells as we can we can make it. Right? So there are biases, but any occludes thalamus. So what you're looking at is the activity of most cortical cells, um, probably with a bias against layer four, for example, um, and anthalamic axons. So the, the, the source of this signal is almost certainly in the top 50 microns of tissue. So it's all, uh, axonal or dendritic signals that we're seeing. Sorry, we're not seeing the activity from the cell body. At least that's what our experiments um, would suggest by trying to uh, figure out where where the signal is coming from. Right. So the first thing I'll show you is these brain-wide recordings. And and keep in mind the relevance of the brain-wide recordings is that's the experiment you we have been doing. And you know science, as in neuroscience, when I say we, has have been doing for the past hundred years. Right. Where this is that the fMRI and EEG are not cell type specific, right? So you can't tell which cells um, the signals is from, uh, sorry, the signals are from, right? And then what you see, sorry, this is now the same mouse um, before and after clozapine. Clozapine is one of the frequently used antipsychotic drugs. It's sort of a, one of the standard of care uh, type of drugs. Um, and I'll show you data for this uh, at, later in the talk. I'll show you two more, but we're we're tr we're, we're actually screening all all antipsychotic, all hundred compounds at the moment, to to see whether the effect is the same. But I'll show you data from clozapine because think of it this as a representative um, drug or molecule, if you will. Anyway, so the point is, if you do this, um, and I hope via the the, the video uh, quality on Zoom, but but if you don't see a difference left right, that's sort of the point I'm trying to make is that. There isn't all that much difference, right? If you if you take a mouse, you give it a drug, and this is consistent with what people have been seeing in in patients, right? I mean, the assumption, as as far as I can tell, the assumption in the field is that the drug itself uh, doesn't do much to cortical activity. Now, um, the discovery we then made again, we we screened a whole bunch of different cell lines: layer two, three excitatory cells, layer four excitatory cells, and then a subtype of layer five excitatory cells. So these are now uh, layer five IT cells. We use a TLX3 mouse line um, to label these cells. And then this is what you see. 
right? And I hope Zoom sort of allows you to to tell now that there's a or to see that there's a big difference between before and after. One of one of the prominent effects is that we have a lot more activity in these layer five cells. And as I'll show you in a second, the the main effect we think is a decorrelation. So what what that we see um, it is a, a reduction of the correlation of activity. This is just visually impressive, right? It's, and this this is really really interesting that you can take one of these TLX3 mice, you give it an antipsychotic, and you can tell, or sorry, you give it a compound, and you can tell. We now think you can tell whether the compound is an antipsychotic simply by looking at the activity patterns in dorsal cortex in these TLX3 um, layer five IT cells, right? Which which means that this might be one might be able to use this to screen for antipsychotic efficacy, right? Which is one of the big hindering problems in developing new antipsychotic drugs is that there isn't really a good way to screen for the efficacy in mice. Because mice have, I mean, as far as we can tell, um, they, 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 it's, it's very difficult until uh, until recently, so until the work of uh, Katarina Schmack and Adam Kepech, I would have said it would be impossible to ask a mouse whether it's whether it's undergoing a hallucination or a psychosis. Um, but they, they've managed. So it, it is possible to do these types of experiments in mice, but it's very difficult. Right? And in, in patients, you can just ask them whether they're seeing things or hearing voices. Anyway, right. But this is the problem of, 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 uh, of using mice to screen these uh, drugs that are meant for psychiatric conditions that are not defined in mice to start with. Anyway, we might have a, a way to to uh, screen for them. Right. The thing I haven't haven't really explained, this is 24 hours later, something that really struck us is that, um, this should be a video, I hope you can see it, is that, um, whoops, I'm sorry, let me play that again, is that the effect lasts for a very, very long time. Right. So this is a single injection at time point zero of, uh, of an antipsychotic drug. And then over, gradually, over the course of days, the effect actually gets stronger. This is a different animal that the one day has very little effect, but at seven day has much stronger effect. And this is very, very hard to explain, right? Because the bioavailability of these drugs is measured in hours. So the classical um, idea is that you give a patient a drug, and then within 24 hours, that drug is, is cleared from the system. Also, why uh, patients take uh, antipsychotic medicine uh, in a rhythm, in a daily rhythm, typically. Um, but the effects we're seeing very bizarre on the order of days um, and not hours, at least these, right? So I promised you I would explain briefly. Um, this this is a bit the, the technical part, um, but what we think is going on, I mean, what you visually saw is an increase of activity is one thing. And the other thing that that's probably from predictive processing um, point of view is slightly more interesting is that it selectively decorrelates these layer five activity patterns. And, and to illustrate this, what, what we're doing is, I'll, I'll just explain how we represent the data in this slide. So what we're doing is very simple. We take a, a 10 minute recording or half an hour or some amount of time that's measured in minutes. And then we uh, just compute how well is the activity in left V1 correlated with uh, right V1, for example. And you do this for, we pick 12 brain areas that we like. And then we compute this for all pairwise um, pairwise correlation coefficients. And we can do this before the drug and after the drug. And when you do this on this, again, the top is what are these brain-wide recordings. You can see that there is a bit of a decorrelation effect. This is apparent because the this is more blue than, than here, right? The colors are red. Red means high correlation. Red is one. Um, blue is actually 0.3 here. Um, but the, so there's a decrease in, in correlation that we already see here. But if you do this for TLX3, uh, the effect is much, much more pronounced. Um, that the, the correlation drops um, very, very strongly in these uh, layer five, uh, TLX3 positive layer five cells. Right, now for the representation, because I'll show you a few of these plots. What we do is we take each of these pairs, right? There's 12 by 12, so 144 divided by two minus the diagonal. Anyway, there's about 70 points. Um, that for for each animal that go into this uh, into this into this plot, where each dot is now one pair of activity, where that is plotted against the distance uh, that the two areas are apart, right? So very far apart areas would be here. This might be V1 and prelimbic here. 
um, and very close by areas, V1 and V2 would be here on the left in the plot and the y-axis is how well they're correlated, right? So there isn't too big of a surprise, the further away two areas are, the less they're correlated. Um, this is just the representation. And to simplify the representation a bit, what I'll actually show you is, is these heat maps, which is just the density interpolation uh, on these dot plots. So the blue heat map is what I'll show you. Right, sorry, and this is the same data again, right? So I'll run you through it again. On the left here, the, top, the middle row uh, is the, the brain-wide recordings. Um, X is the distance between the areas. Y axis is how well they're correlated. And now left is naive, uh, right? Before clozapine, right is after clozapine. And you can see, the, sorry, these these white lines, the isocontour lines are transferred from, from the naive case, just so you have a visual reference to see whether the, the this point cloud drops on average. Um, and, and it does, if you look at these brain-wide recordings, um, but if you look at, uh, just CLX3 layer five uh, cells, the effect is much stronger, right? And you have to, the, the, the intriguing thing of course, is that the brain wide recordings include these layer five uh, IT cells. So if you, I'll show you some data here where if you just look at layer two, three, there's almost no effect. Right? So if you look at the, the, the isocontour line, the white line almost perfectly describes this density plot, which means very few, uh, Correlations actually drop. There, there are effects. The effects are not zero, but they're by far not as strong as in layer five. So we take this to mean that the antipsychotic relatively selectively changes the lateral correlation pattern, the activity pattern in these layer five IT cells, right? And and initially we thought, well, you know, this is a layer two three versus layer five difference. All of layer five just decorrelates, and layer two three doesn't, and then. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, then we learned that that's not the case. So what Matthias then did is take a TLX3 mouse and a FESF2. FESF2 is a, uh, a layer 5 PT, uh, excitatory subtype of cells. These are the pyramidal cells that, uh, sorry, pyramidal tract cells, the excitatory layer 5 that project uh, out, of, uh, out of the forebrain, whereas the TLX3 are the ones that go primarily to cortex and, and uh, to striatum. You can actually see here, they have axons in striatum. Um, so, sorry, the decorrelation effect, this is the data I showed you before. So there's a very strong decorrelation effect from by induced by the antipsychotic. Again, sorry, the labels are missing. Left is before antipsychotic, right after, and or clozapine here. Um, and if you look at phase of two, the effect is absolutely not there. But just like layer two, three, there's there's none of this effect, right? And this is this is extremely peculiar, uh, right? How is this even possible? And I'll I'll spend the the sorry, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about how we're approaching the mechanism. How is this happening, right? Why, how, what could be underlying the, what plasticity is driving this, right? I told you before this happens on a time course of days, the, the drug is long gone, right? The, if this clozapine, you inject it 24 hours later, the, the drug is gone, but we can still measure the effects. I showed you data from seven days. We now have, we know we can, we can still detect this effect two to three weeks after the single dose of an antipsychotic injection. So this clearly must be, tra be tr triggering some form of plasticity, possibly, right? Or it's a completely unknown retention mechanism of, of the drug. Maybe they're you know, taken up uh, intracellularly and then bind to receptors at very different kinetics than what you would uh, have in the bloodstream or on cell surface receptors. All of these are possibilities. We don't understand it, um, but it's, it's super exciting, right? So the, we have a very selective effect on this Felix three cells. Um, I did promise you earlier, I hope that I would show you two more drugs um, that have the same effect or similar effects. These are our purposeol and haliperidol. Um, these were selected for having, these are representatives of different types of antipsychotics. There's the nomenclature varies a bit, but there's, there's typical or classical or first generation antipsychotics. And then there's uh, atypical or second generation of antipsychotics and third generation of antipsychotics. And they distinguish themselves in how they bind to receptors. So the first generation would be one that's a D2 antagonist primarily. The second generation one would be a 5-HD2 antagonist. Um, and then the third generation are, are the things we're developing now that, that don't interact uh, predominantly with either receptor. And th these are representatives of uh, these different classes. And independent of what the receptor binding profile is, we find um, that uh, the effect is the same, right? Which we're, we're super excited by, because um, this might actually be now a, 
sort of a, a signature of, of an antipsychotic drug. So if you want to make something antipsychotic, or if you want to design a molecule that's antipsychotic, you can test whether it decorrelates uh, this uh, TLX3 layer 5 activity in a mouse, which would be exciting, right? And this is sort of what we're doing at the moment. This is a, a PhD student in the lab, Tristan Schilling, who's uh, together with Matthias Heindorf is developing these this high throughput screening where we have lots of these little microscopes. These are now uh, uh, wide field microscopes that we have and, and have a whole array of them where we can just screen, you know, 10 animals in parallel. And and he's building these relatively cheap uh, setups um, that, uh, that can take these measurements easily and quickly. So that's sort of our hope that we can then go get, actually at the moment, I think we've screened about 10 different antipsychotic compounds, and we want to get to, to 100, of course. Right, so how is this relevant, right? Um, or, sorry, before we go to the relevance or why why we're excited by this, how does this work, right? A lot of the work in the lab now focuses on addressing the question, what is the mechanism, right? We, we know something in this TLX3 activity changes. It changes long-term, presumably through plasticity or some plasticity mechanism. Um, can we pinpoint the synapse? Um, is it right? One one simple idea we had originally, which turns out to very likely not be true, is that the antipsychotic sorry the antipsychotic drugs could just strengthen lateral communication in cortex. But the the TLX3 cells are the ones are the cells that that contribute a lot to these lateral communication in cortex. They have um, very strong lateral um, uh, projections to to a distant cortical target. Most long range connections between you know, OFC and V1, for example, are driven by these uh, TLX3 layer five cells. So is it, is it simply the case that these, uh, these uh, communication channels are affected? And then we're, we're using um, a technique that actually Alina de developed um, uh, when she was in the lab, the functional mapping of influences, as we called it at the time. Um, which is to to inject a uh, uh, crimson in uh, brain area A. In our case, we just use ACC because it's a connection we understand well, ACC to V1. You can in inject a uh, virus in ACC with that carries a crimson or expresses a crimson, um, inject the virus in V1 that, that has some calcium indicator, in our case, uh, gcamp 8 s and then stimulate the axons while recording these cells. And then do this with the clozapine, right? And something we see, um, sorry, uh, what you're seeing here, the data at the bottom actually is um, the blue traces are the optogenetic stimulation, the activation of these ACC axons. And as a, as a second stimulus, we also check what, you know, basically what bottom-up input, how is bottom-up input affected? Um, and for this, we just use a visual stimulus because we're in visual cortex. You could, of course, also just stimulate the thalamic axons and you probably would find slightly different uh, results. But but here, we just use great things at the time. Right? This is all work in progress. So I think these data are a few months old at, at most. So, but what uh, Leonardo found when he did this is that with the antipsychotic, um, you get a very drastic increase in the strength of communication, but only acutely, right? In this, while the drug is actually in the system, what happen, What seems to happen is that these layer five cells become massively more excitable, right? It's, right, it's depending on, it's a factor of two, if you look at the, uh, at the amplitude, um, right here for the optostim, uh, the, if, if you quantify this with a factor, it's even stronger, right? Um, because the response initially is so small, but, but you have this, this very, very strong increase um, of excitability or synaptic str strength. We, we don't know this, right? We can't distinguish right now. We're just measuring the functional response of the layer five cells to the axonal stimulation. And at this one hour time point, we get a huge effect. But 24 hours later, and actually now we have data up to seven days where we see the main decorrelation effect, it's basically gone, right? Initially, we were hoping maybe you know, this long range input suddenly becomes inhibitory, right? This this would explain why there's a decorrelation. Um, we have no idea. So it, I think we can safely rule out, I mean, based on this and other experiments I'm not showing you, that, that the antipsychotic actually influences the long range uh, 
connections. It currently, are, and this is very speculative um, to the point where I thought I shouldn't even include data um, to make the point. But I th what we think is might be happening is that the excitability of the cells change or something about the calcium dynamics of the cells. Um, there we see effects um, after seven days uh, in these types of paradigms. W con concurrent with the decorrelation effects we find um, with with the drug on on global activity or dorsal cortex activity patterns. So this is the type of approach, just to give you an idea of what we're taking now. This is all ongoing work um, uh, very recently and, and, and will develop, I'm quite sure, and, and change as we as we make progress um, on this question, right? But this suddenly becomes approachable, right? Now that we have this very strong phenotype of the decorrelation, we can just sort of, you know, pick off all the possibilities, right? It's almost like following a recipe, what you need to test. Is it is it the direct communication? Is it corticothalamic loops that drive it? Uh, is it the excitability of the layer five cells that change? Um, so this is, is quite exciting and quite fun uh, way of doing experiments for us uh, right now. Right, so uh, maybe to, to um, finish on three takeaway speculations, and I tried to highlight these as speculations. This is very speculative, but uh, again, sort of why I'm uh, illustrates, I think, or the, these types of questions illustrate why I'm so excited about what we found, right? So, is it possible that the antipsychotics acutely increase um, activity, right? So they induce some form of seizure-like activity. I'm, I'm using that word very loosely with this seizure, but they trigger some activity pattern that, that might be characterized by very high activity acutely. Um, that then leads to this long-term plasticity that we see. Um, is that possible, right? And, and this is based on two things. One is the data I just showed you, right? The time course is just sort of to, to remind you, we see, you know, the decorrelation, these effects on calcium dynamics uh, seven days later, but acutely we find this effect um, just at plus one hour. Sorry, and what I forgot to mention is that this acute effect we found in every cell type we've looked at, not just layer five, but also layer two, three, right? So clearly we can see that in layer five, there's no acute increase of activity, but there might be a cell type uh, that is acutely increased and, and has this uh, strong drive of activity. The other reason I'm very excited by this is because uh, you, you, the, this might not be well known, but there's a, a therapy that's called ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy, which is a, something that has gone very strongly out of fashion in psychiatry because of this movie, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, that came out in the 60s or 70s, a long time ago. But they depicted the variant of this therapy where, where that was horrific to, to watch. But the idea is that you uh, the, today it's still used. I mean, I mean, certain uh, clinics are picking this up again. Um, and what you do is you attach stimulation electrodes uh, to the, the cortical cerebrate, sorry, to the skull, to the temples of a patient, um, and then you, you anesthetize. It's now, nowadays, it's done under full, uh, uh, full anesthesia. And then you stimulate these electrodes with brief pulses of current for 10 seconds or thereabouts, some very short amount of time. And that's it. Right? You, you do a pulse train. The whole thing lasts maybe two minutes. And you do this once a week for 12 weeks, and this can cure psychosis. This is totally flabbergasting. I've, I've, I've seen patients that go from very strong depression, full-blown psychosis, to three or four treatments of electrodes on your temples stimulating activity, and and they're fine. Right? I mean, obviously, it's, you're not completely fine, but but the but the, the major depression is gone. The psychosis is gone. It's it, it's completely, I mean, as a neuroscientist, when I saw this the first time in my life, I thought this is not possible. I mean, how, how on earth does this work? You just you just zap the brain and then something's supposed to change. It's totally crazy. Anyway, so right, so it's, things we're actually pursuing, right? Now you can combine this in, right, with the wide field technology. You can just see what happens in a mouse, right? Is Are there cell type specific effects? And these are also experiments that we and I hope other groups are pursuing at the moment as well, because this now, you know, this is approachable. Suddenly one can, can, can ask these questions. Is this the effect? Is this the underlying effect? Anyway, I'm super excited by this. And, and I think it's, it's actually experimentally testable. I mean, all these crazy ideas with ECT, we, we see it works. 
there's no idea why, but somehow triggering some activity pattern, maybe in layer five, maybe somewhere else, maybe in thalamus, I, I, no clue. That is done both by ECT and somehow uh, by uh, by these antipsychotics leads to these pattern changes in activity patterns that that you know confer the benefit of the antipsychotic drug in schizophrenia or psychosis patients. Right. So that's very very crude speculation. Again, just to remind you, these are not takeaways. These are takeaway speculations. It's very speculative. Then the second one. Um, something that's bo bothered me ever since we saw these results, right? And, and, and it relates to the fact that the effects we see, these decorrelation effects are only visible in layer five IT cells and not in layer two, three. And later we learned, as I just showed you, not even in layer five PT cells, right? How is this possible? The way we think about cortex, right? There's this beautiful idea of the cortical column that here I'm just, I stole this somewhere from a textbook, I think. Um, that illustrates this idea, right? This the cortical sheet um, or, or the cortical surface, this napkin sized uh, uh, structure that's folded in humans um, is, is very similar, independent of whether you look in visual cortex or orbitofrontal cortex, obviously it's not identical, but, but it has a very similar structure. And the idea has always been, I'm sure you've heard of this, of this idea of the cortical column, that there's a computational unit um, that processes sensor information. And if this unit is in visual cortex, it processes visual information. If it's an auditory cortex, it processes auditory information, etc. Right? And and it, it's been a guiding principle from things like the Blue Brain product. So I'm just showing you this illustratively. Um, this really is, is sort of a central idea in, in, in many neuroscientists that study cortex is this idea of a column, right? And on the right, just something very recent, uh, the Allen Institute had this beautiful data set where they reconstruct uh, uh, EM um, data, and they, they also use a column, right? Because the idea is that there's some uh, computational pattern where, where the different layers, sorry, this is from the original publication that proposed this functional microcircuit idea, where, where these layers, right? Sorry, P2, 2 plus 3, this is layer, this was the old nomenclature for pyramidal cells 2 and 3. There's layer 2 and 3 interact with layer 5, and they form this computational unit, right? And, and so, it, it, just to illustrate, right, sorry, this is just a crude illustration. The way the way I would argue, and, and you know, we at least, I'll, I'll sorry, I'll speak for myself. The way I always thought about cortex up until about a year or two ago, is that you have these these cortical columns, and most of the processing, right? If you're in visual cortex, or if this is a visual cortex column, there's thalamic input that goes into layer four. That's not labeled here in this in this image. Um, from there, it's it's passed on to layer two, three, and then goes down to layer five and is processed somehow with layer six and then sent out to thalamus and striatum and the rest of the brain, right? But if if what we're seeing is true, right, that that you give a mouse an antipsychotic and nothing happens in the lateral communication in layer two, three, but you you scramble or do something to layer five, this image doesn't make sense, right? This, this can't possibly work. Um, sorry. And just to be careful, the, the argument I'm making here is that if the dominant axis of communication is vertical, then our results are very, very hard to explain. Right? And you, you, we, sh and and you, I would argue we should think more in in sort of cortical sheets, right? That maybe most of the processing is is horizontal, not vertical, right? Um, and and this. Obviously, I'm not trying to say that there is no vertical interactions and the vertical communication isn't there. It's clearly there. The synapses are very strong. But what if, right, this is the idea or the speculation, what if the horizontal communication within a genetic cell type is dominant? So it's, it's, it's sort of networks of activity of these cells that do something, right? Layer two, three, we don't understand what it does, or I certainly don't. It does something. And layer five does something, and and sometimes they interact, they communicate, but the dominant communication is horizontal. If that were the case, then you can very easily explain um, explain our data, or th at least then it's not inconsistent. It's sort of very hard to explain. The other reason this I'm very excited by this is something that has actually come out of machine learning, which which is um, a Sorry, it's a concept that's uh, known under many different names. Uh, it's Siamese networks. I'm sure if you haven't heard of it, you'll probably hear of this uh, sometime soon. Um, Jan Lecan, who's head of uh, AI research at Meta, I believe, 
anyway, came up, named it the Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture, and I just like the uh, terminology here. Um, it, 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 the arguments I'm about to make apply also to different variants of, of these ideas, like like I think any Siamese network. But so the the key idea, right? So the, the what we know about cortex is it actually has two input pathways, right? Just assume there's a superficial compartment that does its thing, and there's a deep compartment. Right? Layer two, three, and four is the superficial one. Layer five and six are the deep compartments. So. There are these two compartments. They receive separate thalamic input, right? as we've known from Kevin Martin and Marnie Douglas's work on, on visual cortex and, and uh, Christine Constantinople and Randy Bruno's work on the somatosensory cortex. But there's these two parallel thalamic pathways into cortex. Um, and this is extremely reminiscent of this, this joint, uh, joint embedding predictive architecture where the entire idea is that you, you take an input and you send it to two parallel networks where at the end, with, where the interaction is, you, you basically use one network, the prediction network, to predict the activity of uh, the, 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 your actual target network or your training network. I forget what they call this, context network, maybe. It has a name. But the idea is that you use these, you, you basically run two networks in parallel and, and then train one to predict the other, right? Which... As far as I understand, it's not fully understood why this is so advantageous, why this works. Sorry, I should have mentioned the, the problem this type of architecture solves versus the standard, you know, deep uh, uh, learning architecture that has brought us things like ChatGPT and, and uh, other fun things um, is that this can get away with much less labeled training data. So right, most deep learning architectures that you that you that, that you train end to end with back propagation or your favorite algorithm require state of the art is it requires lots of labeled training data right this is a cat this is a dog this is a cat this is dog you know thousands and millions of of training examples um and this type of architecture can get away with a lot less um and it's 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 sort of taking the machine learning uh, world by storm, uh, as far as I can tell as an outsider, or my colleagues in machine learning tell me this. Anyway, I'm super excited because what if cortex is something similar, right? What if what if the cortical architecture is actually two somewhat parallel networks that interact in this uh, JEPA-like uh, idea? Anyways, just just to 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 again, very very speculative, um, right? I, I fully understand, but I think there there is merit at least in speculating or thinking about whether we can make progress in understanding the system if we think about uh, this horizontal communication a bit more. Right. The last thing or the last speculation I wanted to talk about is um, something we're also working partially on is what, what if all consciousness altering drugs exert their effects mainly in layer five? And this gets sort of back to the original the starting point where we started in predictive processing, the hypothesis for a long time, or if you open a textbook about predictive processing, you, you'll almost certainly find the speculation that the internal representation is in layer five. And just internal representation is predictive processing speak for neural correlative conscious perception, right? If that, if those neurons are active, then if, if you're in an animal area of the brain and there's a cat neuron in layer five, if that neuron is active, then you perceive a cat. That's sort of, sorry, in a, a very hand wavy uh, uh, way to explain the idea of internal representation. Um, um, consciousness altering drugs exert their effects in layer five. Um, that's the idea. And did, I, I already alluded to this, right? There's two other classes of drugs uh, that you can, you can think of. One is, one is anesthetics and the other is uh, psychedelics. Um, and I presume there's more, but those are the ones we, we look at. And actually, very excitingly, uh, this seems to be the case, at least for anesthetics. Uh, both Androshka and Arjun uh, Barioke had this paper uh, uh, two years ago, uh, where they where they described exactly this that there's this very peculiar um, cortex wide synchronous activity uh, that you get in layer five with anesthetics, um, and this is absent in other cortical layers, right? So what if this layer five is actually the relevant uh, part? And and we've been we are following up on this, and it, it I, I I will leave you with this <coughs> last bit because I think it's. Extremely beautiful. This is something a PhD student, Laura Mondoran, 
has has been doing is just just very simply sort of reproducing what what uh, Arjun and Botton have have demonstrated, um, but now using wi wide field uh, imaging across the entire dorsal cortex um, and doing it in these two cell types that we know are specific, are you know involved or sorry TLX3 is the one we know is involved in the antipsychotic effect as if two doesn't have the antipsychotic effect but just seeing whether are these activity patterns that that, that Arjun and Botton described do we see those as well and what do they look like right do they have the same types of activity patterns in these two cell types and I'll just show you this these are just single examples and um, again this is things I think Roman saw a few weeks ago uh, and I hope this sort of conveys but you can see that that it's it's not synchronous activity in the sense that the entire network goes up and down. You find these beautiful wave-like activity patterns, and and I hope you can see it in Zoom. But if you can't, what, what's happening is that in these TLX3 animals, in sorry, in this, these are different mice. It's not the same mice. But if we image in TLX3, what we see is that S1 seems to be a hot spot, and from there waves propagate through cortex. So you get these wave-like propagation of activity that spans the entire cortex. Um, and the totally crazy thing is the activity pattern in FESF2, as far as we can tell, right? Again, this, these are not, we can't do the experiment yet in the same mice. So we need to infer that it would be the same if we were to do it in the same mice. But if you look in FESF2, um, you get completely different activity patterns. There's again, wave-like activity, but they start in a different place in the cortex. So you can see that, so I, I hope you can see Again, you're seeing most of dorsal cortex, and, and this would be the midline. And these are these cingulate areas that start this activity pattern from, from where it then spreads posterior and lateral. Um, very different from the TLX3 activity pattern, which seems to like there's this wave like activity spread um, from uh, what looks like somatosensory cortex. Anyway, so these and these anesthetics, they do seem to do something very, very specific um, uh, to this layer five. Uh, activity. Um, and I, whenever I see this, I mean, I, I've stared at these uh, videos for hours, and whenever I see this, I, I, it sort of reminds me of a, 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 a sort of a car engine that's about to start, but right? it feels like the, the, the network is trying to start and, and can't, right? So clearly, it, it, the drug is doing something to it that, that has the consequence of anesthetizing the mouse, or the human in our case, but the uh, like the question is what is it doing to the network that has that effect and this is the question we're trying to pursue anyway this is sort of I wanted to leave you with this um, with this idea and these videos and uh, we're super excited by this I think this is really a, a a novel it's a very useful technique that we've almost completely switched to in the lab uh, this wide field imaging and using basically using drugs that are known to work in humans in reverse, if you will, right? To just characterize the effect that the drugs, which we know work, have in a cortical circuit, instead of using the alternate approach, which is to use mouse models of disease. Right? And with this, thank you very much for your attention. These are, the, again, the people uh, currently in the lab uh, who are doing all the work and uh, you know everybody who has been in the lab and our collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Georg. That was indeed fascinating. A new Georg, <laughs> all completely new. <laughs> I really feel like your research has turned around, like you said. Uh, I think my first question is, where is predictive coding in this? So I, I saw the model that you said uh, about the two layers of, of um, the predicting layer and then the actual perceiving layer. But do you think that layer five is the predictive layer or the actual context layer or whatever you called it so, would you say that these like psychotic effects are on the on the predictive yes. side or on the yeah sorry the so the classic the classic um, predictive processing idea sorry i'll just use this uh, you know maybe but the classic predictive processing idea is that in layer two three you have prediction error neurons um and these prediction errors need to be integrated somewhere and these are the internal representation neurons and and the again, the, the, the classic idea is that layer five functions as prediction error, as internal representation for the prediction errors in layer two, three. But that, that, I mean, that's also how, I mean, again, this is not just, I'm not trying to say this is, this is wrong. I mean, we don't, we don't know. 
this was always a speculation. It was definitely also my speculation. I mean, if you read a, a review that, that I co-authored from three years ago, you'll find this everywhere, right? Even we've speculated this multiple times. Now, given these data, I think that is hard to uphold, right? So there's there's two possibilities. Either we're just doing something wrong and fundamentally something's happening that we don't understand. One one thing that we're seriously considering is that maybe the calcium activity <coughs> doesn't reflect electrical activity all that well, at least on this scale, right? Um, it, especially given that man, many of these antipsychotic drugs are known to interfere in one way or another with calcium dynamics, right? By uh, by interfering with uh, voltage gated calcium channels, etc. So they they have the potential to do something to the to the calcium dynamic that would decouple calcium from electrical. Anyway, so that is always a possibility. Just to, to head to sort of to caveat uh, the conclusions. If if that's not the case, right? If actually we're seeing a decorrelation of layer five, then uh, electrically, right? Then an alternative would be, which which we have speculated more recently, is that maybe layer two, three is fully self-contained in that there's positive prediction errors, there's negative prediction errors, and internal representations, right? The Allen has identified three cell types in layer two, three, and you know we 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 think we can map one of them onto positive prediction errors, another one onto negative prediction errors, molecularly, sorry. And the third one, the question is, well, what is it doing, right? And obviously, clearly predictive processing is wrong, just to say this out loud, right? It's, or incomplete, right? Or at, the, at the very best, it's incomplete. Um, but it, it just postulates the three cell types. So the question is, what would the third one be? Why, why is it the third cell type? And one, one possibility that we're entertaining is that maybe that is the internal representation norm. So that would mean layer two, three has a fully self-contained predictive processing circuit. Um, and then maybe layer five has, again, has a fully self-contained predictive processing circuit and they communicate somehow, maybe via this JEPA idea, I don't know, sorry, maybe, you know, something like this where the two networks now now start to uh, predict each other. And, and all of this is somewhat crazy. Um, but keep in, right, I think it's important to keep in mind that cortex usually is not um, sorry, archi cortex is not six layer. Right? You have you have um, the origins of cortex are probably two three layered structures that have sort of overlaid. So they may really be separate computational units uh, in that sense. Um, anyway, sorry, that's a rather long winded answer. The short answer is we have no idea. It's, like, it's yeah. Sorry, we don't know how this relates. It's really that's sort of we saw this, and it's I have no idea how to integrate this into into uh, predictive processing. I mean, there are ways you can. It's not impossible to 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 reconcile, but with sort of the classic textbook version, it doesn't work all that well. So um, this is really co cool, Georg, and you talked a lot about layer two, three, and five. Have you looked at all in layer six? Yes. Yes. What are six doing? Yeah. So, so this. Sorry, I'll go back to a schema here. So what we think, and, and again, this is based on on rather less data than I would like, but but we're working on it. So what it looks like right now is that these TLX three cells. It's even slightly more complicated because it's not all layer five IT cells or not all layer five TLX three that have the effect. It is really just the very superficial. Cells. We we realized this. Uh, Leonardo Lupri, a uh, postdoc in the lab, realized this recently because he saw that when he when he took that TLX3 Cree mouse and crossed it to a reporter line, he gets a different population of cells than we take some dull TLX3 and injects a virus, and that labels beautifully two separate populations. And we want the 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 cross labels all cells, and the virus only labels uh, the deep cells deep TLX3 cells. So what it looks like is that there's a population of very sensitive or antipsychotic sensitive cells that are superficial TLX3 cells. And then the one line in layer six we've looked at is NTSR1. That uh, Sorry, we've looked at TLE4 and NTSR1. And now I need to be careful. One, because I, I forget, one of the two shows the effect and the other one doesn't. I think it's the, the NTSR1 which where the cells are slightly deeper. Uh, in layer six. So it looks like there's, there's a population of the cells that has an antipsychotic effect at the very superficial part of layer five, six, and then the very deep layer six or one subset. We haven't 
we really don't know which one it is yet, uh, but we do get uh, the cells that have the effect with NTSR1. Also, again, this is based on very, very, very scant data um, with only uh, two or three animals in each group. But um, but these are exactly the questions where we're, we're pursuing now, right? This is the, the how, which cell types, how can we target them? Which ones have these effects? And why would this be the case? Thank you. Uh, I will start reading the questions from the Q&A. So we have uh, Razvan asking us, uh, could there be a subcortical global coordinator that controls the layer five cells and the drugs act on it? Yes, absolutely. So um, the one of the, uh, there's, there's many candidates that could have this role. One of the, one of them, one sorry, one immediate one that we thought of is thalamic input. And the, I think thalamus we can rule out based on the fact that layer four doesn't have any of the effect and the, layer five does get input from thalamus directly. Um, but uh, I've been talking to people who know a lot more about this than I do. It looks like, and, and this isn't well established as far as I could gather, but it looks like thalamic cells that have an axon in, in that, that target layer four are the same ones that target uh, layer five cells. So, um, I mean, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But if the, the point is that the layer four doesn't have the effect, which is likely strongly driven by thalamus, um, then we can't fully exclude it, right? Because it could still, everything I just said could be not correct. And it, there could be a separate cell, a set of uh, cells in layer five, uh, sorry, in thalamus that only project the layer, these TLX3 cells. This we just can't rule out yet. But these are exactly the types of questions we're, we're now testing one by one, right? And, and the... The, our hope is that we find one of these connections that actually has an effect at seven days, right? Where we can clearly say, okay, this is the connection that is modified at seven days after the antipsychotic, and hence likely driving this effect. That's how we're now going about. And almost all projects in the lab now focus on these, uh, trying to understand the mechanism um, that underlies these decorrelation effects that we saw. So absolutely, the answer is yes. It could be the layer five network, and as I just uh, showed you, we don't think it's we don't think based on the data we have is that it's a communication laterally that's actually affected, which means what well, this leaves uh, another input or a loop, a corticothalamic loop that does it, uh, or or a, a common input or excitability of the cells. Thank you, Georg. So it looks like there's a couple of related questions, um, and that has they have to do with uh, mice, schizophrenic mice, or the phenotype of the mouse. So um, these uh, they're both anonymous, but um, fascinating experiments. But do you have thoughts on whether this interaction of layer five with antipsychotic drugs stays the same in schizophrenic mice? Um, could it be that schizophrenic mice have some change in layer two, three, and would antipsychotics help that? Um, how does this effect change with the phenotype of the mouse? <laughs> yes, excellent question. These are also things we're looking at at the moment. We, I, uh, I, I didn't show it unfortunately. We do have we have looked at um, a subset of. I mean, there's many different uh, schizophrenia mouse models. We have looked at two of them. Um, one is the LGDEL, and the other one is one we made in house that's based on ADNP, um, which is an autism schizophrenia gene. Uh, so is LGDEL. So LGDEL is also an autism mouse model and the schizophrenia mouse model. But in both of these mice, what we find is that the brain-wide activity, which is something we don't see with the antipsychotics, right? The brain-wide activity has a little effect, but not a very strong one. Um, the brain-wide activity in, in schizophrenia mouse models is increased. Sorry, the, not the activity, but the correlation. So these these plots I showed you. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. So, so we we do find the opposite effect. Now we've been we've been so these these decrease. So if you look if you do this experiment and you can't do it within mice, of course, but you take uh, uh, you know non uh, wild type litter light wild type litter mates and compare them to to uh, LGDEL um, uh, homozygous mice. Well, anyway, mouse model of disease. You see that there's an increase um, of uh, correlation in these mice. We've been trying to identify which cell type. Uh, has the effect, 
and that there we're just running into one technical problem after another. But initial experiments suggest actually that the mouse models do not have an effect in layer five. So at least a subset of layer five is unaffected uh, in uh, the mouse models. And, and the reason I'm caveating this is because what we did is take an LG Dell mice, cross it to TLX3, but then use the virus to label this, the, to, to add the GCAP. And, and we only just learned two weeks ago that that labels only a subset of the TLX3 population if we do it with the virus, right? So we would need to work with the triple genetic to actually have the comparable experiment. But at least in that subset of TLX3, we saw no, no even though we saw brain-wide increases in correlation, we saw no effect in layer five. And, and yeah, one, one possibility, which is somewhat somewhat crazy, is that that because, you know, the, the if if you have this, Right. If you have a, a sort of a processing scheme of this variety, right, it is conceivable that there's something wrong in layer two, three in, in the disease, right, the increased correlation, or it might be layer four. Um, and that you can you can remedy because layer two, three does not project out, right? This is a computational entity that can only communicate with the rest of the brain through layer five, right? The 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 input goes to layer five and only from there does it go out. So if you have this type of uh, setup, then you could, in principle, explain how a defect or, or a circuit dysfunction in layer two, three can be corrected um, by doing something to layer five. Right? This is obviously very speculative, but and and based, but but we do see correlation effects. Um, we don't fully understand them. We don't really know where they're from yet. Um, they may even be in the thalamic input uh, that we don't know. Yeah, but that is excellent question. That this. There's so much to do, fortunately. I, I think this will keep us busy for another decade or two, at the least. That's good news. <laughs> so we have a, a question from Daniel Gavrilescu. Does it open new practical opportunities for personalized psychiat psychiatric medicine in the foreseeable future, uh, helping psychotic patients and any non-medical interventions, which may leverage those layer mechanisms for the sake of personality disorders, which are more pervasive than psychotic pathologies. Yes, I mean, I have, I have, so currently, I think the, the most relevant impact that our work can have is on the, the providing an ability to screen for effect, efficacy of, of medicines. Um, I have personally, and this is, I mean, we're, we're, we just started an entire research project on this, on the ECT I was talking about, the electroconvulsive therapy. That would be a non-medical intervention, um, sorry, a non-drug-based intervention um, that seems to work as well. And maybe, you know, simpler things, or you, you can even, this is totally crazy, right? But if if the lateral connections, we know we can influence them with things like mindfulness training and and uh, 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 not neurolinguistic programming, sorry, neurofeedback as a name where you record your EEG and then you focus on changing the EEG patterns, right? We can do this. Um, so, so you know, just imagine we were able to identify which in an EEG signal, what is the layer five signature? Also something we're trying to understand now is in mouse EEG, what is the signature of layer five activity, right? It might be the movement onset 30 Hertz, right? I'm just making things up, but in principle, it is conceivable that you can identify a cell type specific contribution um, to an EEG signal, which now we can test in the mouse. But imagine you can do something like neurofeedback with uh, with a device that knows which part of the EEG is actually from layer five. Then you can start experimenting with things like this. Right? I think that that would be cool, and that would then at least uh, partially uh, alleviate the need for um, a drug based approach or uh, electrical stimulation based approach. I mean, I'm sure. But within reason, right? I think that 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 might be viable uh, for many people, whereas for others, clearly the the medicine or the drug based approach is the right way to go for many patients. So, but yeah, I think it opens up a lot a lot of new possibilities. I'm super excited. Cool. Um. Okay. So, should we we still have time for more, right? Hey, I do. How are you, Georg? With time. At, yes, yeah, let's take one more and then should probably move on. Okay, this, um, so let's do one that just came in. Um, do you believe mental imagery, uh, 
visual or auditory is the expression of predictive coding. And if so, uh, do, you, do you think that people who are unable to generate imagery have a change in their capacity to perform predictive coding? Difficult question. So the <laughs> mental imagery can be explained with predictive coding. Um, the there's, there's something that we don't that, that at least I never considered deeply or in in most of what we do the experiments are very banal that that relate to predictive coding things like mental imagery rely on you know how well is how strongly how strong is the connection between v1 and a1 right which might be the thing that drives synesthesia right? if that is a bit too strong then then you might be uh, synesthete or if you're uh, ACC to V1 connection is very strong. That might enable you to very vividly uh, imagine things visually, right? But at the same time, you can't do that for for um, sounds, right? I, I can I can easily visualize images very strongly, but sounds, I, I mean, I, I I can't reconstruct the melody for the life of me, right? Absolutely not, right? So something something is changed in the way, presumably, right? The, the, if predictive coding is correct, what what this would mean is that the connection between some high level of cortical area and V1 is stronger in my brain than it is between high level area and A1, or or you know the part of the brain that processes the melodies. Um, so in in that sense, I think predictive coding can explain these things, or at least in principle. It, and it's not the only explanation, right? There, there's many. So um, it's it's not entirely clear um, what what the uh, prediction would be. I think most of these things like synesthesia and how well you visualize or or how, how well people can perform mental imagery or in the extreme case have aphantasia, right? When they would, uh, not, sorry, not patients, but people who claim that they cannot visual, who say, sorry, not claim, who say that they cannot visualize anything, right? That they cannot form mental images. It's very hard to compare. What does that mean, right? It's like, if I say I can visualize an apple, what do I see all the detail the way a painter would? Probably not. Right? But so we, we all differ slightly and uh, not not just slightly strongly in how how well we can visualize things um so and but a lot of that likely has just to do with with connection strengths now between specific areas and and, and predictive coding makes no uh no um claims on on how strong these things are right? so it's it's a bit hard to relate the two thank you thank you very much Georg. It was lovely to have you. Thank you very much. For we'll have you and again. For moderating. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to us and for bearing with us. This whole questionnaire for us was really fascinating. Uh, we are coming back live again in uh, two weeks with Tobias Rose. So please join us again. And until then, have a good evening and enjoy your time. <laughs> thank Thanks you. A lot.